I'm Julian from Swivel Finance. Uh, I'm technically the CEO, but I do a lot over there. Um, and today we're generally going to be talking about ETH2 and the way that we can really use DeFi products to kind of amplify both the security of, eco of the ecosystem generally, as well as just <laughs> the attractiveness of what we can offer in DeFi itself. So to start, really, what is block space, right? Block space is generally just a reservation of some computation space on the Ethereum network for specifically the mutation of state, right? So generally speaking, when you try to submit a transaction, it's going to require a certain amount of computation, and you then must reserve a certain amount of block space, of course, to transfer those funds or whatever you're doing. Um, also, generally speaking, right, this is supplied by validators in ETH2, supplied by miners traditionally, and the demand really then just comes from purely user transactions or arbitrage or whatever it might be, right? So, yeah, going towards demand. You see that, generally speaking, it actually is insanely volatile, right? It's very difficult to predict demand. Uh, there are a number of just confounding factors that continue to screw up any sort of models people have made. And really, at the end of the day, um, this volatility is fueled by mutually extractable opportunities, right? Whenever there is volatility in the market itself, uh, there's liquidation opportunities, arbitrage opportunities, et cetera. Whenever there are <laughs> NFT drops, like that massive one up to 450 gas for an entire day, um, it just in, it screws things up for really how people must price and create instruments around the ETH2 market. On the other side, right, we see that supply is kind of weird, right? You, you have an increasing number of validators, um, and this will continue to increase. It really hasn't started to plateau, in my opinion, yet. Uh, but on the other side of that, right, the actual block space within a given block is actually static. So you really look at this and kind of have to think of it in, in two ways, right? And, and when it comes to uh, the factors of block space, right, you have to look at a number of things that will impact the yields of the validators and how that really uh, uh, makes the product attractive to them, right? You kind of have to make things financially incentivized. Um, so then the question comes, right, when you're looking at block space and these supply and demand factors, how can you actually properly price these, right? To start, obviously, everyone knows of base rewards. Um, most people actually don't know that this kind of, it does shift depending on how much demand there is within a short period, right? So if a block is full, there's more rewards in the next block. And, and essentially, they just try to, to move around on this direction. Um, but on the other side of this, right, what most people are most familiar with is just purely uh, the fees that you pay, right? If you want to get a transaction through, in a reasonable amount of time, you have to pay a fee. And I mean, the important factor is really that this has been very clearly an increasingly impactful mechanism over the past few years, right? You cannot really look at purely any of these base rewards or other factors alone. You have to really get abstract with your thinking. So on the other side of that, right, you can also disincentivize negative activity. Um, and this really just introduces more risks for validators than uh, really people recognize at this point in time. Right, uh, there's an entire row of, of, of blocks that were entirely uh, completely destroyed in the past. Um, and realistically, you end up having to, to, sorry, I actually did the wrong slide, next one. Um, you end up getting slashed, and, and, and a validator ended up getting slashed, I think, on about 20 slots in a row. Um, so it's pretty horrible, this happens, and there are real risks there that users must kind of accept. Really, at the end of the day as well, okay, on the demand side, or rather the, the, the APY that you can earn and the yield, um, we're seeing increasing amounts of this not coming from the traditional mempool tips and et cetera, but large blocks that are proposed by off-chain relays, primarily flashbots, right? In a row here, right, you have about 20, or no, I think that's about 10 within about 100 transactions. Um, or no, actually, that's only about 20 blocks. Um, and really, these transactions allow people to do a lot, and particularly, right, as a validator it's themselves, uh, you can begin to actually extract these opportunities from others. Uh, interestingly, we haven't seen a lot of malicious validators do this yet, but that also does present a risk, right? And the final factor, right, when you talk about pricing block space, has to be dilution. Um, generally speaking, again, I said that this isn't plateauing. Uh, it's very consistent because there's a certain amount of validators that can actually be introduced per day. And at the end of the day, we've seen that over the past year, um, regardless of increases of yield based on, you know, MEV and, and the ETH2 merge, val validator yields have actually just been diluted by 50%. Uh, if this continues, right, we will see yields crunch, 
but you need to introduce more incentives for this to continue, right? You need to ensure that the, the network is secure, and you do that by continuing to introduce incentives for these parties. So at the end of the day, really what is the massive risk? Whether there's going to be demand. And, at, and for pretty much every factor other than slashing, demand is just a function for it, right? So then when you actually try to apply this, you get this massive formula, where effectively you have the base fees, the fees themselves, MEV and tips, um, and as well dilution, all really kind of dependent on, on demand, um, as well as these time factors, right? If you know that six months from now there's going to be a 5% yield, well, you can actually predict things pretty accurately. However, if this is gonna be massively volatile over that time period, you need to actually do some pretty complicated stuff in there, right? So the question becomes, why, right? There's all this math, there's all this, honestly, this crap <laughs> involved in trying to do this. Um, why actually create products that can, can do it? And at the end of the day, it's really because you can create validator experiences that honestly exceed anything that is available today. So getting into really how you do this, right? What are Blockspace capital markets? At their core, Blockspace capital markets allow users to take the future yield that they might generate on some amount of Blockspace that they can commit and sell that to other people to reserve today, whether that's in direct reservations like Eden Network, uh, whether that's through peer-to-peer -peer transactions directly like Alchemia, or whether that's through larger validator pools and everything like Lido and et cetera through the stack of, of Swivel. Um, and on our end, I think that's some, something is very important to note, right? We split up the components into yield tokens and principal tokens. So if you took a, a deposit on Lido and you instead immediately gave it to us, we would take that deposit, we would split it into those two components, the yield tokens representing the yield that would actually be generated, and the principal tokens representing your actual deposit itself, and allow you to actually trade those, right? So the most common use case there is then, well, I want to trade away my yield tokens, that future yield, to somebody else. And the result really is that as a staker, you then are completely insulated from any slashing risks, any dilution risks, any volatility. And on the other side, the party is effectively leveraging massively on the rate, right? You can either hedge your costs if you are a validator yourself. You can hedge variability or, I mean, at this point in time, Rate, the gas price is literally on, on a regular basis down to two, uh, you could speculate that it will increase over the next year, right? These are very, very important dynamics that are standard, honestly, in almost any commodity, but for some reason right now, they aren't really in ETH. But then, okay, there are multiple designs to do something like this. And the question really becomes, what can we do with these designs, right? You have a, a base layer of staking, to then continue to increase the capabilities of your validators, and in doing so, increase the safety of your network. And the question then comes in, okay, what are the things you are looking for? And really, at the end of the day, it's composability. You have the ability with these sorts of uh, maturable instruments that are designed around block space to create composable instruments that are continuously rehypothecated. The first examples being just composable principal tokens, right? I mentioned that this mechanism creates principal tokens that are redeemable one for one. This is extremely important because this is a mechanism that is shared by about 10 protocols. This then introduced the ability for hyper-composability -comp across a number of different yield generation sources, ensuring that there is liquidity for these markets and they can continue to be built upon. So let's say, they can, or really then looking back at the two different models, okay, well, how can you continue to build on top of them? Um, Alchemia is a very popular project that is working in this direction. Uh, they take individual validators and they ensure that those validators can find counterparties to purchase effectively those yield tokens. Um, these, these agreements are, again, individual validators and they all have unique maturities, uh, which effectively means that they are completely non-fungible, they cannot be rehypothecated re generally, and you cannot really trade them on secondary markets. The upside being of Alchemia, I don't want to just crap on them, you know, you can address this market of individual validators and there are a lot of bespoke validators out there. However, right, if you want to build a more composable product, you can combine these sorts of things with Lido with Rocket Pool. And instead of having an agreement that goes directly from validator to a contract buyer, you route that liquidity through a third party validator that is composable, like Lido, like Rocket Pool, and then through them, you actually create this contract. And by doing that, right, 
you then start to have the ability to create more and more interesting instruments. A first example, this is a, a friend of our protocols. They, they let people take those principal tokens and borrow against them at extremely high LTVs, around 90 to 95%. In context, that represents the ability to leverage on the stake yield way, for, way more than anyone really ever would. It allows you to continue to hedge in many directions. And at the end of the day, it continues to provide utility to these stake yield products that allow you to make more composable, interesting things. This is probably my most <laughs> exciting slide, or the one I like most. Um, there are really a ton of advantages native to DeFi for fixed maturity instruments that are not replicatable in traditional finance. Primarily, the ability to, like I've said, rehypothecate atomically. And in the context of these maturing instruments, a principal token, let's say you have, in this case, 100 or 1,000 principal tokens maturing on December 31st, can then potentially be used as collateral to underwrite options, right? In this case, again, you'd take that principal token, you know it's maturing on December 31st, and you would find a counterparty that would accept that, knowing that they would also have that face value at December 31st as well. Uh, again, this is a completely unique mar market for DeFi, right? Try going to a bank with your bonds or with your T-bills that you bought this year at 4%, right, that everyone's bragging about, and asking them if you can underwrite some puts or anything with it, right? You will find that they will laugh you out the door and it's like, it, it's just kind of a joke to them. Um, again, I think this is probably one of the more exciting things going on right now. The ability to take these assets that really are only traditionally used in one way and to combine them into these, these structured products that allow you to utilize them further. In this case, specifically, you have the ability to lend your stake yield Right? You're capturing the, the base yield, the MEV, the tips. You're capturing it, just everything from EIP 559, <laughs> if that was happening. You're capturing a lending yield on another protocol. And then in addition to all of that, you can capture an options yield. And go going further down that rabbit hole, right? here's another protocol that is another friend of ours where uh, they effectively create expirable futures products. Uh, it's honestly kind of complicated how they do it, right? Uh, but the bottom line is they, they use fixed rate markets that themselves can be backed by ETH consensus to create these expirable futures. And in context, it's actually very interesting because the most common use case of expirable futures is, is hedging options. Um, so at the end of the day, you actually are already seeing this, this symbiotic ecosystem where users are able to hedge regular just trading markets in both directions while getting additional yield. And all of these, this liquidity is then routed through the base ETH consensus layer. That's, that's the big conclusion I'm trying to, to push, right? Is that at the end of the day, composability is the king thing or the largest thing that you can do to ensure that the ETH consensus is secure. And beyond that, ensure that users are continuously attracted towards these products, right? I, I think that we have an extreme opportunity to, at this point, capture uh, the attraction of people that really, at the end of the day, are more oriented to TradFi. Uh, the, the big statement that is always said is that you need to create a user experience that is 10 times better to onboard them from one platform to another. And really, only these DeFi unique products will be able to do that. Um, so yeah, th that's really the point. At the end of the day, every derivative instrument in DeFi, every, pretty much everything other than perps, will be being routed through ETH2. Um, and at the end of the day as well, this will all be being routed through these fixed rate instruments. I'm, I'm Julian, uh, I'm the founder of Swivel Finance, uh, so feel free to reach out, uh, follow me, and or join our Discord at uh, discord.gg slash swivel file, uh, just swivel. Um, yeah, that's it, any questions? Um, right, in the, right in the beginning you were talking about validators supplying block space, Yeah. Um, but the block space remains constant throughout, like you said, so would they, I mean, so how do, how do, how do you define as them supplying it as opposed to like them constraining it or at selling it? At the end of the day, while the block space from the demand point of view is static, the suppliers are still competing to be the one that actually provides it, if that makes sense, right? So when looking at pricing this future yield, it'd be ideal to just have exact metrics for block space directly in a given block, but you really have to be looking at heuristics, right? Um, gas price and all these things. And you know, in, in context, it's, it's just about you know, a kind of trying to get anything you can to just derive the, the, the base block space rate, or like something that you should try to price and sell your yield at. Uh, so you mentioned uh, block space and uh, those markets. How does the fungibility of block, sp block space uh, make pricing harder? 
It's extremely difficult to honestly uh, create any markets without fungibility, honestly. Uh, we were looking at creating Swivel initially with a sort of non-fungible agreement similar to Alchemia. Um, but when you start to do this, you silo off liquidity and users are no longer able to compare uh, kind of what one other person would do for it, right? At the end of the day, most pricing is actually <laughs> rather subjective and you need contextual markets in order to price things, right? Um, I, I talk about this a lot more in, in reference to just the fixed rate space in general. It's extremely important to ensure that maturities themselves are fungible for even these, some sort of si these sorts of similar uh, activities. Uh, the distinction that you, you noticed, which is that for these kind of like splitting and like rehypothecating um, future staking yields, uh, it kind of requires going through uh, you know central-ish validator of some kind, generally speaking. Is there any way around that? Like, is there a world in which we can create uh, fungible claims to like individual home stakers? A, I'd hope that honestly, Alchemy is working further in this direction. Um, it's more difficult than one would think, I'm sure, right? Because you actually then have to actually you have to create the infrastructure between a validator client and some DAP. And honestly, I don't think anyone is doing that whatsoever yet. Um, really, it's going to be a difficult problem for them to solve. I think they can, you know, create more fungible markets. Is kind of the way I'd put it, by by forcing people to use a certain maturity and only trading within that, right? Um, but at the at the end of the day, I think it's more of a, a technical problem than than a market design one, probably. Would the return profile and the volatility of the split out yield aspect of it not just mirror Ethereum anyway? It would, yes. That's the point. And when you, if you split away your Ethereum, you're not. It's not going to do anything. What you need to do is find a counterparty to buy the the yield token, the split away yield that you're going to be earning over some future date, right? Um, and th that's why, again, it's very important to try to create these markets that are fungible and liquid. Otherwise, it's it becomes increasingly difficult to actually find these counterparties. And then as well, right, if you don't have a secondary market for anyone to sell anything on, it's impossible, right? Uh, so you really need, it, really answering your question, you just, you're selling, you're selling those yield tokens to another counterparty, and that person is going to be the beneficiary of whatever ETH staking, et cetera, yeah.